be seated. I want to welcome everybody, whether in person or online. We are so glad that you are here uh, to witness to our faith in Jesus Christ and to just bring glory and praise to our God. Um, make sure if you're a first-time visitor that you get one of our coffee mugs. Uh, inside that coffee mug, you'll find some chocolate, a pen, and my business card. Uh, everybody fill out a Connect card. Make sure your name is legible. And uh, if you, I, I pray through all the names on Monday morning. And if you have a specific prayer request, a joy or a concern, put that on the back. And then, uh, let's see, I want to make sure that we, uh, um, well, she's not here. Well, she's in Sunday school, I think. She wanted to experience that. We do have a new team member. Uh, Renee Cafaso is going to be our next generation pastor. So uh, children and family ministry. So we're excited. And we'll try to get her to come and be introduced to you in this service as well. Um, with that being said, would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you're an awesome God, that it is your idea by which we live. As you wonderfully and fearfully stirred us together in our mother's womb, you began to lay out the plans that you have for each of us, plans to prosper and not to harm us. So, Father, we simply come today to give you acknowledgement for who you are as our God to thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for his sacrifice on Calvary's Hill and to remind ourselves that life is far too serious to take it that way. In Jesus' name, and all God's kids said, amen. amen. Would you please rise? Or no, actually, yeah, it's called us to worship, right? Thanks, D. So rise for D. It's okay if you stay seated. Either way works just fine. This is going to be one of those fun days where we're just happy to be here. So on the, it'll be on the screen, and it's on your paper in front of you. We gather for worship, frazzled from running errands and running committees, running out of energy and running out of time, running from problems and running from uncomfortable truths. Let us open our hearts to the possible that we might be renewed in spirit and in our desire to be a people of inclusion and love. To the God who leads us through uncertain times and challenges us to risk all, let us lift our voices in praise. So join us in singing, This is the Day. children's chat. Renee, would you come on up? You might as well bring the kids up for children's chat, too. <laughs> come on down. I'm so glad you're back. Good morning again. How are you? Are you good? She's sugared, so she's ready. 
Okay. Maggie, are you coming? Come. Oh, you want to come on up, Lincoln? All right. Nice. So Renee, Renee is our new uh, next gen pastor. Would you please welcome her? And next gen is our children and family ministries. So uh, just to give you an idea. Do you guys want to sit on the floor if you promise to help me get up? <laughs> oh. So did, how many of you guys like to laugh? Whoops. See, got Lisa to laugh. Good job. Who was it? Groucho Marx was good at, uh, at comedy. Yeah. So what makes you laugh? So when somebody tickles you, that makes you laugh. We call that a giggle, don't we? Yeah. Do you ever see something on TV that makes you laugh? Do you have any cartoons that you watch that make you laugh? When I was growing up, I loved Bugs Bunny. Yeah, Elmer Fudd, that wascally rabbit. <laughs> America's Funniest Home Videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always tell people before, before weddings, I say, our goal is to not be on America's Funniest Home Video. You know, I want your wedding to be special, memorable, but let's not have one of those ones. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that the Bible tells us that it's a good thing to laugh? Did you know that? You guys ready to learn a Bible verse? Okay. Can you say, Simon says, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Proverbs 17, 22, a cheerful heart is good medicine. So why do we need medicine? To make you feel better? And it's even better if the medicine tastes like bubble gum instead of iodine, right? You like bubble gum? Do you like bubble gum, Maggie? You do too? Wow. Wow. You're not, you can't have gum yet? You're looking forward to the day you can have bubble gum. Yes. Okay. Me too. Mm. Anyway, that's a different story. Uh, but here's the deal. If, if laughter is good medicine, that means there must be something we're sick from. Did you notice that? Because you don't take medicine if you're not sick. So if you have a sad heart, one of the best ways to make your heart feel better is to find something good to laugh at to find something that cheers your heart up. And I remember Jesus in all the different ways. You know, one of the reasons we do children's chats every Sunday is because Jesus was walking along and he saw a bunch of children and the disciples wanted them to stay away from Jesus because they thought he had two important things to say and he didn't have time to play with children. Have you ever been so busy that you couldn't play? You have? You've been too busy, girl. <laughs> I love that video we started out with. Did you see any of it? You had a, an old guy on a little, you know, rocking horse. It was hilarious. And you just got a rocking horse, didn't you, yesterday? Yeah, that was neat. But here's the deal. Life can be hard, but God has given us laughter to make it easier. Did you hear what I said? Life can be hard no matter what age, but God has given us the ability to laugh to make it easier. So you can trust the Bible in Proverbs when it says laughter is good medicine. So you know, sometimes all it takes to change your mood from being sad or maybe even mad is to laugh. And so this button reminds me, especially when I'm having a bad day, maybe somebody leaves my office having, after having made me sad or mad, and I reach over and I press this button. You know what it says? So I give it over to God, and then I take from God a little bit of humor. So I love to remember jokes. You want to hear a good joke? It was taught to me by my six-year-old granddaughter. Are you ready? Do you know what a seagull is? A seagull is a bird that flies near the sea. So what do you call a seagull when it flies over Tampa Bay? A bagel. You've heard it before. Ah! I just love dad jokes, man. They're great. 
They are so great. All right. Well, let's pray. Are you ready? Dear God, thank you so much for making me and giving me the ability to laugh. Amen. Did you know Jesus laughed? I think he laughed a lot more than people read in their Bible because they don't read it. You can see it between the lines all the time, especially with his friends, Peter, James, and John. They would say things and do things where he'd go, Oy vey. <laughs> All right, guys, have fun. Oh, anybody else want to press the button? <laughs> I got it. Thanks, Renee. I don't know why you come to church, but that's why I come. <laughs> All right, would you stand and join us in singing this medley? Love lifted me and I've got joy. in his mask didn't even <laughs> drop down from the ceilings uh, you may be seated for our congregational prayer Natalie batter up <clears throat> good morning good morning we draw near to you almighty God united as brothers and sisters within your kingdom. 
gathering together, we lift our eyes to see your face. Expecting with faith, we lay our lives before you. Lord, may your Holy Spirit transform us. May your light shine upon us and bring peace. We open our ears to hear your good news. We open our eyes to see your truth. And we open our hearts to receive your endless love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, and be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass us against us. Lead not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right. One thing about my wife, you never know what's coming next. <clears throat> oh, man. <clears throat> How many of you know that we are commanded to be joyful? Did you know that? Is it easy to be, always be joyful? And then you read the Apostle Paul, who sometimes can raise the bar pretty high, and he says, consider it all pure and he's talking about what? Trials and persecution. And I'm like, you got into the peyote, didn't you, Paul? <laughs> but, you know, joy and happiness, while they're related, they are not brother and sister. You can, as a Christian, as somebody who has found not only eternal life, but abundant life in Jesus Christ, in the midst of great happiness, you can find joy. In the midst of a great trial or tragedy, you can find joy. Joy is something that comes from heaven to each person who believes. Joy cannot be generated by circumstance. It is a gift from God. It is a gift that is meant to be opened every single day. And one of the keys to experiencing the joy of heaven is the ability to laugh. When was the last time each of you had a good laugh? You've been coming here for a while. I've been here a little over two years, and I love to laugh. Have you noticed? I laugh at myself. I laugh with you, not at you. <laughs> but I love to laugh, and I encourage you to laugh. Life is too serious to take it that way. You hear that again, and then I want you to say it to your neighbors because it's true. Life is too serious to take it that way. All right, turn to your neighbor, and let's share that. Life is too serious to take it that way. It is. Sometimes it's so serious it hurts, right? It hurts to where it hurts to hurt. But in the midst of that kind of pain, in the midst of that kind of suffering or doubt or shame or guilt or whatever negative thing that Satan has led you into or Satan is trying to pull you back into, there can be joy. Why? Because you're a child of the forever king, God, Jesus who is the Christ. So don't let Satan take away your birthright to joy. Um, can I get my slideshow up there? Uh, this is our very brief series on uh, marriage builders, but it applies to all significant relationships. Uh, does this couple happy? Okay, let's play a game. Lisa and I used to, <laughs> we'd go to the mall. She'd go to shop, but then she would take pity on me because I'm sitting out there all by myself. <laughs> Because, you know, I don't know, the, the, the new buildings, they don't understand, at least the old school men. I, I go because I want to please my wife. If I go to a mall, it's usually going to be a store that has exactly what I want. I know about what I'm willing to pay for it. And I don't go shopping. I acquire things. You know, but Lisa, you know, back in the day when malls were a thing, she could go to the mall and spend hours and come away with nothing. And that so confuses me. 
Uh, it's experience. But anyway, a well-designed mall or shop has benches for guys like me to sit. And I don't just sit there and go to sleep, although I admit I have done that a few times. Uh, I watch people. How many of you like to watch people? Do you imagine where they came from? Imagine what they do, if they have kids or not. And if they have kids, you wonder if they want to get rid of those kids. <laughs> but we would do that. We'd sit there and there'd be somebody walking down the mall dressed up. And, uh, I think he's a banker. Oh, I think he's a lawyer. And then he'd get up next to us and he'd sound like he was from my old hometown, Hicksville, Ohio. <laughs> and we have lawyers and we have doctors, but yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> here's the deal. You can observe life. And humor is nothing but taking what you see, taking what you hear, taking what you experience, and turning it just a little bit like a diamond. A diamond is nothing but a rock. A piece of coal under pressure for thousands of years becomes a what? A diamond. So you have the power of Christ living in you. That is far more power than what it takes to make a diamond. So be an observer of life. Uh, see people, hear people, experience people, and allow the imagination of God through the Holy Spirit to come into your life. And not just to observe them by sitting on a bench in a mall or uh, observe them. Uh, this couple is probably in a pastor's office uh, going through a very difficult moment in their marriage. But the truth is, bring Christ into all of us. And then the words of the Apostle Paul won't sound so strange. Consider it all poor jo pure joy, my brothers and sisters, because Christ has overcome the world. That last part isn't the words of Paul. That is the words of our master. In this world, you will have what? Troubles or trials. But he says, don't fear. Why? Because I have overcome the world. In Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are called and empowered to be an overcomer. You know, uh, when I do premarital counseling, I'm always careful to tell them I also do marital counseling. Why do you suppose that is? <laughs> they might need it. Actually, Buzz, I'd go so far as they're likely to need it, okay? Uh, here's the deal. That starry-eyed love um, that we come into marriage, uh, and I've only had a few couples that didn't seem to have that, and uh, that confused me a little bit, I've got to be honest. Uh, but they did fine. In fact, you know, one couple, 30 years marriage, I guess, pretty close to it, because I married them early on in my time at Pasadena. Uh, but that starry-eyed love can easily be suff suffocated by accumulated stress. How many of you know what stress is? How many of you have ever been overwhelmed by stress? You're not sure whether you're going to get through the night or sleep through the night or have another breath or make it through a meeting or a phone call? Stress is a palpable thing. It can suck the energy and life out of you. It can destroy hope. So looking at this moment as a, as a counselor with many hours with different couples, the, this couple, I don't know what the presenting issue is, but looking at their countenance, they're not connected to each other. Uh, he's lost in a thought that could easily be interpreted. He did something wrong. Don't you hate it? You bring your wife a dozen red roses, and the first thing she says to you is what? What would you do wrong? Right? Well, this is after the roses moment, in my opinion. And he is lost. He's suffocated. She's angry, but the truth is she's just as lost. That starry-eyed love is lost. But it begins long before this moment in a counselor's or a pastor's office. You start by adding a mortgage to your marriage. Anybody remember your first mortgage payment? Wouldn't you love to have that today? Oh, my gosh, you pay more for insurance than we used to pay for mortgages. It's crazy. You know, granted, it was a, you know, a little 3-1. Three, three it had one bathroom, right? It was a little Cape Cod that had been built for the GIs returning from World War II. That was our first house. It was good enough for us. It had a basement. I remodeled it at an 800 square foot. So the living space nearly doubled it. <laughs> so you start with... All we need is love. Da, 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 da. All you need is love. But then you got to pay a mortgage, okay? And then the bills begin to pile up. And then, then there's expectations at job. And it used to be one job, but now it's usually two or more jobs per family. And then you add children to the mix, thinking that'll make it better, right? 
Some of you laugh like you understand. Uh, and along with children come parenting issues. How many of you felt a little overwhelmed as a parent? How many of you still feel overwhelmed as a parent? <laughs> you know. Uh, and before you know it, love feels like a distant memory. And it's not limited to marriage. Do you remember when you made your first best friend? You know, you don't have to remember their name. Some of it's been 50, 60, 70 years. You probably can't forget their name, can you? They were the, they were the one that you used to play with on recess. They're the one that was, would come to your birthday party and give you what you really wanted, not something that was on sale at Bargain City. They're the ones that was there when your heart broke with that first lost love. In my case, there's a guy named Ed Welly. Still a good friend, probably not my best friend because years and distance has separated us. But when my, uh, uh, it turned out Lisa and I had a mutual friend uh, before we met each other, but we were at his funeral together. And, uh, you know, my friend Ed Welly called, and we were both uh, seniors in high school. And you know what he did for me? Uh, he said, I understand that one of your friends in New Haven, he was from Hicksville, uh, one of your friends in New Haven uh, was killed in a motorcycle accident, and you guys were heading to Florida. And I said, yeah, that's right. Ed <laughs> bought a six-pack of beer. <laughs> and he came over with me, and he sat with me. And I had never tasted beer before you before then, and I decided right then and there I didn't like the taste. But in that moment with my friend Ed, it didn't matter what it tasted like. It helped me swallow the bitter taste of death as an 18-year-old kid. You can't laugh in a moment like that. But you can be next to a friend who knows and cares. Doesn't have any of the right words to say and doesn't, he was Roman Catholic and I was a good Methodist boy. So he didn't understand that Methodists are teetotalers. <laughs> Not always and certainly less so today, but back then that was the case. So what do you do when the first blush of romance is washed away, when the friendship, the sands of time erodes? What do you do? I remember my friend Ed, and you probably don't need to know, but you probably should, since some of you think I'm a, a homophobe. I'm not. Ed's gay. He was the first boy to ever make a pass at me, and I punched him out. <laughs> you know, how many of you think life is complex? Laughter helps unravel what you can't figure out. So nibble on the headlines. The headlines of your life and the headlines that are happening around the world. It's horrendous what's happening in Palestine again. And my heart breaks for Israel. My heart breaks for the backlash in the people in Hamas. They are clearly the perpetrators of evil this round. And they need to be stopped. But understand that life is complex. None of us are as good as we think we are. Each of us that may be the hero in our own story is a zero in somebody else's. It's when we allow the entanglements of life to choke us, to choke the life out of us, to choke the hope off of our hope for other people. So nibble on the headlines in your life and in the world, but feast on the comics. What are some of your favorite comics? Beetle Bailey. Wasn't Beetle Bailey great? He always got it right, didn't he? <laughs> Who else? Fa Family Circus. I love them. They're, I'm <laughs> it really was. A lot of those, it's like, oh, they peeked in the window, didn't they? Uh, yeah, and then uh, how about this one? It's fall. This has been running 50 years. <laughs> I laughed. The first time, I laughed every year. I, la I looked for this cartoon. So what's the setup on this? Lucy has to talk a guy 50 times 
in a row, once a year, every fall. This time, Charlie Bond, I swear I won't want. Move the ball. But she does every time. He falls for it. How many of you love to fall for the same joke several times? Some people can just tell a joke. I just love it. There was a guy in this conference. i got to be careful on the clock. Thanks for removing that lens. I can actually see the time now. Uh, gosh, his name has just escaped me. Anyway, he told the same four jokes in every sermon. But the way he told them made you laugh. He just did. He was hilarious. But that's who Charles Schultz was. Uh, but not all laughter can be reduced or found in the comic strips. How about this? What do you see? What do you see? The little boy's laughing. They're wearing red noses. And the doctor's doing what? Checking his heart. So it could be a routine visit, and that could just be her MO, her modus operandi. Or it could be that uh, this child is suffering from cancer. It could be that this child has uh, been brought by a mom and a dad that are into their rope. Their hopes and dreams wrapped up in this little boy have come unraveled. And here we have this doctor who steps into the, the breach, the place that shouldn't be there but is there in so many of our lives. And she brings laughter. You know, I've served many first churches. Uh, uh, and a lot of first churches live up to the reputation. They're fussed. How many of you can imagine the bishop in good conscience sending me to a fuss judge? But it happened more than a few times. Pasadena Community Church uh, was not technically a fuss judge, but it was. It had a lot of people that were very serious about their religion. A lot of people that thought it was almost a sin to laugh, at least in church. I'm sure they laughed in the bars, but they <laughs> that was at a different issue. Okay, but... I remember I served First Hudson, and I love the people at First Hudson, still do. They have an amazing heart for ministry, an amazing heart for the Lord. <coughs> for the Lord. Um, but uh, I'd been there three years, and I still had a lot of people that were kind of stiff, kind of stuffy. And so I was always poking at them. Can you imagine me doing that? No. Just trying to get them to laugh. And so I walked into Walgreens, and it was a red nose thing, and that's for muscular dystrophy, right? And so I bought uh, maybe 15, 16 red noses for my staff meeting that was going to happen later that morning. And I took them to the staff meeting, and I, I put mine on, and everybody laughed. And then I started passing them around, and the laughter stopped. <laughs> you know, in fact, Daryl, who is my worship leader, who is an excellent musician and an excellent worship leader, but very tightly wound. You know, he fit a fuss church very well. And when the box came to Daryl, he looked at it with disdain and said, you're not making me put one of these on. <laughs> and I'm thinking, huh, well, all right, there is that whole supervisor thing, and there's this peer pressure thing, but he was still like, no, you're not going to make me make a fool of myself. And I said, I don't have to. You've already done it. <laughs> I didn't say it out loud, but that's what I'm thinking. You know, so they all put it on, and then they're laughing. It's really funny. And then uh, I said, tweak your neighbor's nose. <laughs> and so uh, my neighbor happened to be my administrative assistant, Christy, and I went honk, honk, and everybody got it. And so they all went around the circle going honk, honk, not just on the right, but on the left, honk, honk. And they really got into it, and you should have heard them giggling like school kids, all except who? Daryl. But Daryl is now beat red. I can see he's having an internal conflict. He wants to have fun with the other kids. But he's wired in such a way he feels like he always must be the adult. And to play is somehow an inferior response to life. To his credit, Daryl put his nose on, but he wouldn't let anybody honk it. <laughs> I say all that to say this. Life is hard. It is. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, because the Christ has come and has overcome the world. When it's hardest to laugh, when you may not be able to giggle, hear the laughter that God has supplied around you. It's there. You just got to listen for it. 
And if it's the reason you can't laugh is because you're trying to maintain this image, you're trying to have that stiff upper lip because part of your DNA is British, <laughs> let your lip quiver. Let your lips open in laughter. Give out a big ha, 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 ha. I tell you, you know you're beginning to really laugh when your belly shakes like a bowl full of jelly. <laughs> Santa's got something going on. So there is the canned humor, the comic strips. There's a humor that we enter into intentionally because life is hard. And sometimes we can't really step away. But we need to step into it with Christ. How many of you have ever played this game? I don't know if you can see it because of the screens, but they have cards on their forehead. So they can see their neighbor's card, but they can't see their card. So on the woman on the right, it says, she's supposed to be a cat. And the woman on the left, she's supposed to be a fox. And so they're supposed to give hints to one another until they guess who they are. How many of you have played a game like that? Doesn't it make you laugh? It does. Uh, these kids are in sixth grade, right? No. When was the last time you played? When was the last time you made a new friend through laughter? When was the last time you helped a friend carry their burden because instead of focusing on the death of their husband, you got them to giggle? Laughter is good medicine. It's a gift from God. It, it can move, of, uh, must move us off of our stubbornness and it can help us reconnect with others and with God. You know, that button is here for a reason. Laughter is God's reset button. And it is easy even when life is hard. Now, that may sound odd. It may sound simplistic. But it works. And it is biblical. Read it with me. A cheerful heart is good medicine. But a broken spirit saps a person's strength. You know, modern medicine supports this biblical prescription. Laughter stimulates healing. And it relaxes your muscles. Did you know that I smile a lot? Do you know it basically means I'm lazy? It literally may, takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. So some of you just need to relax and smile more often. Uh, there's a, a, a famous preacher, he was a Nazarene preacher and became a, a leadership, uh, John MacArthur. MacArthur? That's not right. I, I, his first name is John. Uh, anyway, I, I went to a seminar that he was throwing on leadership, um, church leadership, and he said, look at my face. And so we all did. And then he said what everybody was thinking. <laughs> he says, it's a pretty homely looking face, isn't it? And it was. It was. He said, uh, one of the best pieces of advice I got uh, was uh, that I should smile. He says, I was staring at myself in the mirror one day, and I smiled, and you know what? It helped. <laughs> I don't care who you are. I don't care whether you think you're beautiful or a sad sack. Smile. Not only are you being lazy, you're helping other people form a better impression of you. <laughs> so uh, laughter stimulates healing, physical, mental, emotional, relational. It lowers your stress. You know, stress is a hormonal response. If you are suddenly frightened, if you go to Hollow Scream over at uh, Rock the Universe, first, I think you're crazy. Uh, but second, I think you must be able to manage your stress a little bit because if somebody jumped out at me in one of those uniforms or the outfits and made a noise like that, I'd knock them into yesterday. But stress gears you for fight or flight. And humor, snickers, laughter, giggles, it lowers the stress hormones in your body. It decreases your blood pressure. It makes you settle in to whatever it is you must face. You know, there's a reason that I give you God's truth with a spoonful of sugar. Not to tickle your ears, but to lower your stress. Because when you're in the middle of a fight or a flight situation, in your marriage, in your business, in your health, in your finances. I need you to lighten up so you can begin to live again. So I love to use humor one-on-one -on -one and in public. It allows the Holy Spirit 
to get behind your reserve. It allows the Christ to redeem what you're really struggling with, to get you to face it and then overcome it in his strength, not your own. Laughter is our reset button. It diminishes pain. It just does. I don't know about you, but we all have our sets of pains. You know, every now and then, anybody ever get uh, like a pain in your your gut or heartburn, we call it? Anybody get heartburn? Uh, you know, you can go with Prilosec if you want to. I mean, they love to take your money. And if you're on it, I'm not telling you not to take it. But I'm telling you what has worked for me since I've been about 18 or 19 years old. When I would get keyed up under a great amount of stress, and I would feel that pressure in my chest, and I would feel it in, the, you know, the... Uh, what's this muscle called? The diaphragm, and it begins to restrict. I would laugh. I would make myself laugh. I'd remember the canned humor, and I'd I'd laugh at situations my own laugh, life. I'd start out small, and then finally, I'm I'm doing gut level laughing. And you know what that does? It relieves the pain. Now I am not an MD. I'm a soul doctor. But I want to tell you, laughter works. I can recommend it firsthand. It does. Now, I'm not saying if you have a chronic pain, you don't go see the MD. For crying out loud, do that. That's why you have insurance that costs, you know, $20 million a year, okay? Laughter helps you sleep. It just does. Um, It diminishes your pain, your physical, emotional, mental, relational pain. And so when the Bible tells you, don't go to sleep in your anger, it's saying, for God's sakes, laugh. You're taking someone else, yourself, or a situation too seriously. Who's in charge of your life? God. If you have said that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, here's the deal. You can key yourself up physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, relationship, uh, relationally on any issue that you're facing right now. You can key that. You need to be concerned. But you don't need to wrap yourself around the axle of that issue. You need to wrap yourself around the love of God. You know, one of the fondest memories I have of my father is when he'd go on a long trip. And we'd all fall asleep on the way home because we didn't have to drive the car. You know, I always wanted to drive the car, but I was five and God said, or Dad said no. I killed joy. Anyway, here's the deal. I'd fall asleep in a back seat. And again, one of my fondest memories of my father was he would pick me up and carry it in my, my bedroom and tuck me in the bed. Whatever you're facing right now, when you have that image of God's overarching fatherhood, of his grace, of his love, of his provision, you can laugh. And laughter will allow you to get the breath of heaven in and get the bad air of whatever it is you're facing out. Does that make sense? So for God's sakes, laugh. For your sake, laugh. For your marriage or your friendship's sake, laugh. Have you ever been around someone that just doesn't want you to laugh? Oh, that Daryl was, you know, I had to grab him one day after I saw an interaction between him and one of our uh, music leaders. Uh, It had a large church program. And uh, I wouldn't do it in front of the person, but I grabbed him and I was angry. He had told her, don't laugh. You can't laugh. And he used it just, and said it just like that. And I said, Daryl, I don't ever want you to uh, talk to one of God's kids, much less one of our staff people that way ever again. If you do, you have decided you don't want to work here. And he only responded that kind of blunt force. He still disagreed with me. Why do people in general, why do people not want other people to laugh in their presence? Because they think they're laughing at them. A tightly controlled person really feels that this is not true. What does this mean? Your right's into the tip of your nose. And so does everybody. And everything between the tip of my nose and your nose is called a what? Relationship. And every relationship ultimately is governed by God or governed by man. And the ones governed by man, just like Tuesday night's Bible study, we talked about the Tower of Babel. The ones governed by man are always about control. And that is not God's way. God's way is to laugh, to see each other, to hear each other, and to take life with a little bit of levity. To not hold people to something they said as if somehow they're testifying at the Supreme Court. 
But to know that sometimes, have you ever said something you didn't really think through or didn't really mean? Have you ever done that? I do it all the time. I'm so glad I married Grace. Her name is Lisa. Okay. <laughs> so for God's sakes, laugh. It'll improve your life. Proverbs 22, uh, 24 through 25 says this. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Read it with me. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. I follow this. It's not just a saying in the Bible. This is one of the guiding principles on whether I will sustain or create a relationship with anyone. It doesn't matter whether it's family, friends, strangers, supervisors. You know, I've had to hold supervisors at length. I have to treat them with respect and do what they ask me to do. But I have a few that I couldn't respect. If I can respect you and you can respect me, we can play together. Did you know that? But if I can't respect you or you can't respect me, then it's all about being reserved. So how many of you would love to, to date or marry grumpy? No. So this is not just biblical principle. It's just intuitive to our own nature. Laughter should be near the surface of your life, near the surface of your relationships, not hidden deep within. And I don't care if you're from England or from Ireland. You know, the, you know what the, how you can tell what an Irish person is thinking? Look at their face or just listen with your ears. They'll tell you, okay? How can you tell what somebody from Britain is thinking? Exactly. <laughs> so laughter, it's meant to strengthen relationships. It builds bonds between people. You can start out, you know, in the hospital, uh, uh, what is it, about a month ago now, down at Cleveland Clinic after that bleed incident, uh, we made all kinds of new friends. You know, the one guy... Um, the morning I got discharged, it was the first time he'd come into the room, and he was uh, my nurse. You know, there are male nurses. They're pretty good, by the way, just so you know. And uh, anyway, uh, he was a little reserved and just doing his job. And so I started talking to him, go figure, right? And uh, so then I found out that he's got kids. And I said, well, do you ever tell him dad jokes? And he says, yeah. I said, what's one of the dad jokes you've got? And I don't even remember what it was. He said, at first he said he couldn't think of one, and that's because he's in a tightly controlled professional setting right? Uh, and he's like, no, I'm not supposed to do this. But I got them all to tell jokes and laugh and have fun, including him. You can do this with anybody. And so he told me, uh, his second trip back into the room, he says, I got one. And he told me this dad joke, and it was a groaner. It was straight out of the pages of Boy's Life. But it made us both laugh. And then, and then and he said, do you have one? And I gave him the bagel joke. And he roared. He says, I'm going to take that one home, you know? And, and then back and forth. And so I'm convinced he and the other people came into my room because they love to laugh. Would you rather laugh or cry? That's because God made you to laugh. Uh, Laura Kurtz did a study with 77 couples and found that those who laughed together consistently rated their relationship higher. So you've got to know how and when to laugh. Those who laughed more together tend to have a higher quality relationship. Because the shields aren't up. You're not guarding what you say. You're able to share what you're feeling and thinking. And your partner can help you not take yourself so seriously. You know, humor is personal, though. Do you know what I mean by that? What makes me laugh may not what? Make you laugh. So here's some tips, because laughter is personal. Uh, these are tips for married couples, tips for brothers and sisters. I don't care if you've been brothers and sisters 60 years. Find their funny bone and learn how to tickle it, okay? Because laughter builds community. Laughter can rebuild or restore community, whether it's two people or an entire family or an entire corporation or an entire church. How many of you think this church laughs more today than two years ago when we came? Oh, my gosh. I love to see people laugh. Creativity goes through the roof. Feelings of safety and respect and warmth are there. So if you want a church that makes you feel like you're safe in the back of the room, this probably isn't for you. Eventually, I'll find you out. <laughs> and I'll find your funny bone. And I'll not ever laugh at you, but I'll learn to laugh with you. And so that's really the first tip. Learn each other's personality and sense of humor. Because you don't want to use laughter to offend. Uh, 
So I'm going to move this back into the realm of marriage, but it applies to all significant relationships. Do you know your spouse? How well do you know your spouse? What's their favorite ice cream? What's the color of their eyes? Lisa and I went through this one this week. I said, uh, what are the color of my eyes? And she said, hazel. They've always been hazel, you know? Sometimes they get brown, but that's for a different reason. Anyway, but I said, she asked, well, what's my eye colors? And I said, they're hazel. She said, they're blue. I said, I don't care what you lied on your, your marriage license or your, your driver's license. They're hazel. And so later on, I went and looked just to make sure I had got it right. <laughs> and they are hazel, okay? And she says, they're blue. So guess what color they are? Blue, exactly. <laughs> so you've got to learn. If they're significant to you and you are significant to them, learn what makes them giggle. You know, what makes us giggle isn't the same thing that makes us chuckle or laugh or roll on the floor. You know, uh, each personality type has its own comfort level with joking and laughing. So you must be sensitive to them. Even if you've been married 20, 30, 40, 50 years, even if you've been best friends since fourth grade, one of the funnest assignments is to learn how to, what makes them laugh and learn how to make them laugh. Um, so here's the deal. Be sensitive. The Bible says, read it with me, Ecclesiastes 3, 4, there is a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance. How many of you used to love to dance? How many of you look at people that can dance and say, huh. <laughs> we used to dance. Holy cow, I'd love to dance again, but I just can't. I just can't. But I'm going to try it again. How about you? Think a happy thought. Remember, that's what made Peter Plan fly. So if I can get a happy enough thought, since I don't drink, <laughs> it's going to take a happy thought, okay? Uh, some laugh easily. Some laugh easily at themselves. How many of you can laugh at yourself? I, I do it all the time. I love to, after the, the pain of the moment wears off, I love to tell embarrassing stories about me. Not, you know, partially because I'm a pastor, and pastor, some people think pastors are on a pedestal, and that's the funniest joke of all. <laughs> you know, uh, I had to go for another one of those stupid, what is it? Elagard, you know, get rid of your testosterone shots, which I've, I've convinced myself I don't need anymore. And I've talked my oncologist into, you know, he's saying, well, maybe the three instead of the six month. And because I'm like, you know what? I'd rather go ahead and just live as me for the next seven years and live as somebody else for nine. So you may not agree with that, but I'm telling you, that's where I'm at. So I went over to the VA hospital in Orlando uh, and I was uh, dead set that I was going to tell them I'm done, you know. And maybe if they gave me a three instead of a six month shot, I'd say, okay. Uh, but, you know, we left at 6.30 in the morning. It's kind of dark, have you noticed? So Lisa gets in the car, and because she can, guess what she did? <laughs> Fell asleep. And so I'm on autopilot. I'm not awake. I can't drink anything because I'm going over to see a urologist, you know. And so I'm, I'm like, <laughs> and I wake up somewhere in Bartow. Did I mention I'm going to the VA hospital in Orlando? And then I wake Lisa up and I say, honey, would you Google this, at, you know, uh, the Lake Nona VA Center? And she did. And it says, take a right on Rifle Road, which is, I said, that's not right. So I argued with Google Maps. And then we get to Lakeland and I pull my phone out and I put it in. And it says the same thing. It says we're an hour and 40 minutes away from the clinic, which is only an hour and 20 minutes away from here. And I'm like, I'm in the twilight zone. Those were my exact words. I said, something's gone wrong with Google Maps. They've hacked Google Maps. <laughs> so I finally come to my senses and said, honey, I'm on autopilot. I'm going to Moffat again. <laughs> and so then, just to rub a little salt in the wound, I got up on I-4, and guess what it was? A parking lot. Move three feet, stop for three minutes. Move three feet, stop for three minutes. Not kidding you at all. And so I'm getting mad. I'm frustrated. And then I do what some of you do. I say, I'm already convinced I don't want to take another shot. So I'm saying, this is a sign from God. <laughs> and then a sign from Satan. It said, Cracker Barrel, next exit. I said, honey, we're going to breakfast. <laughs> Long and the short, just to finish that so I don't leave you hanging. Uh, the bottom line is, I did go get the shot. And they, because of the timing, which apparently was God's effort, not just mine, they gave me the three months. So I... 
I have another lease on life as somebody else, but that's a different story. So you've got to learn each other's personality and sense of humor. There is a time to laugh and a time to cry. The second time is to laugh with each other, not at each other. How many of you love to be the brunt of a joke? And yet we do it all the time. I'm looking at the time. Is that clock right? Is that right? Wow. I'm done, technically. <laughs> the joke's on me. Uh, here, let's just fine-tune it with this. We, we won't. Maybe we will. You never told me about a job interview. Tam, do you ever listen to me? It was the last thing that I said in bed to you last night. No, I believe, if you recall, the last thing you said to me in bed last night was, No! <laughs> You're thinking of tonight. <laughs> table, I had to take a, a saber saw to get me off of that table. Don't yeah. you think you should go to the emergency room? I was just there. They said I wasn't a priority. Wow. <laughs> Why? Was there a guy with a whole table stuck to his head? <laughs> a sitcom even they know where the line is so if sarcasm is part of your family great but make sure look at it again look at it regular intervals that you're not actually using your humor as passive aggressive behavior that you're not injuring people look in their eyes and if everybody's laughing but their eyes aren't laughing even if they've got a smile on their face cease and desist here's the biblical warrant read it with me Ephesians 5 obscene stories foolish talk and coarse jokes, those are not for you, Christian. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. And then the, the third one is establish your own inside jokes that promote laughter. You know, for those of you who know Lisa and me for a while, we've been married 40 years. We dated five years before we got married. We know each other pretty well. It irritates the snot out of me sometimes when she finishes my thought, my sentence before I can finish the thought. It just, it's just irritating. And she knows it, you know. But we do have inside jokes. Be, be careful uh, that you don't just live together for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, begin to share uh, an intimacy that humor promotes and restores. It's, I, I'll tell this joke and then we'll move to the end of the message. Uh, I just love this joke. It's just, I'm sorry. Uh, I beg your forgiveness. So a guy went to prison. How many of you would like to go to prison? No, thanks. It's a pretty scary place. So the first night in prison, uh, he's laying there in his bed, scared to death, and somebody uh, on his wing of the prison uh, shouts out, 44! And everybody on the whole prison ward laughs. And then somebody else out yells out, 72! And everybody laughs again. So he uh, timidly says to his cellmate, what's the deal? Somebody yells out a number and everybody laughs. And the, his prison mate says, well... We've been in here, all been in here so long, we know the jokes. So we put numbers on them. So somebody just calls out a number, and then we all laugh. And so the guy didn't want to be left out. So he shouted, 21! And nobody laughed. And he says, what's going on? And his cellmate said, well, some people just can't tell a joke. <laughs> Proverbs 27 says, oil and perfume make the heart glad. Understand that you can dress up your body and you can be appealing to the stranger. And for those of you who are married, for crying out loud, have date nights where you intentionally get dressed, at least take a bath, okay? <laughs> and then go out to dinner, have a movie, uh, maybe a, a dinner together, and then just pretend like it's special because it is. Oil and perfume make the heart glad. You, you, you have a date. You know, some of you, how many of you have ever made a phone call and before this important phone call you rehearsed what you were going to say? You need to do that with humor. You know, canned humor has a place. Have a, have a, a sense of what you're going to say. Before you go to bed tonight, if you're married, I want you to think of a humorous story. And it usually begins for us like this. Honey, do you remember the time when? And you tell it 
looking to bring out the sweetness in your relationship. Because you can tell a joke. You're not serving a life sentence together, but you are married for life. Um, and the fourth tip is just this. Use laughter to make up and get back on track. Yeah, I know, they say, you know, uh, make up sex is the best sex, but I want to tell you what, whether you're in that phase of life or you're not, the truth is laughter works better. It does. Um, stresses in this world are great. Married, widowed, single, divorced. Stresses are great. But laughter is greater because it's a gift from God. Stress is an arrow from Satan. Choose to use laughter as a tool to help you make up. Whether it's your best friend, an alienated brother or sister, a child, a grandchild, well-placed laughter, inside jokes, light-hearted interactions might just be the ticket to get that relationship back on track. You know, when I get together with my granddaughters, I hate being a long-distance grandpa. I do. I love being with them. And so we do silly things together right off the bat. I want to be known as the silly grandpa, not the preacher grandpa. So we, you know, you go into their house uh, and they say, Grandpa, can we play hide and seek? Sure we can. I've just been sitting on my backside, which has been asleep for two and a half hours. But yeah, let's run around and uh, play hide and seek. And then tell me your latest knock-knock joke. Don't you love knock-knock jokes? This is not abstract. And it's not just with marriage or family, it's with friends. When I get together with friends for dinner that I haven't seen in a while, as I'm driving to that dinner, I try to remember humorous moments. Like the time that I used to, uh, in seminary, uh, Greg Rawls, he asked, he says, I understand you're pretty, he says to me, I understand you're pre pretty good handyman. I said, yeah, I'm, I know my way around a hammer. And then he said, can you help me in my basement? And I showed up at his basement with my tools, and uh, he says, we're remodeling it. I go, what do you mean, remodeling? And it was like 1,100 square feet, and it was bare walls. <laughs> he said, I need a little help in my basement. And then uh, David uh, proceeded uh, to uh, show me where his materials were and said, uh, I'll be back to check and see if you need anything. <laughs> you know what? I felt put upon. How about, how, would you? But today, that is a hilarious, most funny thing. You know, when he told me recently he was going to be remodeling his... Uh, uh, cabin in the Carolinas, there was a long pause. <laughs> and then he says, but I don't need your help. <laughs> Here's the deal, folks. Read it with me, Isaiah 55. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace, and it isn't based on your circumstances. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Not because of what Paul has said, but because of what Christ has promised. In this world, you will have trouble. But, oh, but take heart because I have what? Overcome it. So the mountains and the hills will burst first in the song before you. And all the trees of the field will what? Clap their hands. Did you know that God's creation applauds? Applauds. When you don't buy into the siren song that Satan sings to each and every one of us. It's a dirge. But instead, you find the joy. You create the joy through simple canned humor, through humor that's built through interactions with your best friends, with your neighbors, and even the strangers, maybe in a hospital setting. This is the power of the peace and the joy of Jesus Christ. Join the applause. So the question I asked for this week in this Marriage Builder series was, does the Bible say laughter is good medicine? It absolutely does. Laughter is the best medicine. Amen? Amen. Would you like to sing the last song? I'm so glad. That way Jeanette will laugh with me. <laughs> We're changing the last song. Do we have it on the screen? We're going to, I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. The first and third verses. Marilyn, are you laughing yet? All right. I have got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Clear. Down in my heart. Clear. Down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. Jesus, I love Jesus, down in my heart. 
I wish, I so wish I had some of those red noses to put on you. <laughs> it will happen, and I hope you'll laugh. May you receive this blessing. There is a God who knows you. There's a God who gave Abraham and Sarah the desire of their heart, and they called him Isaac, which means laughter. God wants you to give the desire, to give you the desire of your heart. So take that into this coming week. Take it into all your significant relationships, and for God's sakes, laugh. There's a an, uh, change in the time on the trunk or treat. We're going to run from 5 to 7 to give the preschool a little extra time to clear the parking lot. You can come early. The preschool usually leaves by 4. So set up time. Please decorate your trunk and bring a candy for the kids. We'll, it'll be out here in this parking lot uh, on the 31st, easy to remember, Halloween. And then also, uh, Jeanette is pulling together a Christmas choir. We'll get together and practice a few times to sing for Christmas Eve only. So for those of you who fear going into the choir, I got into the choir when I was about that tall, and I'm still singing. But this isn't that kind of a commitment. It's just a commitment for Christmas Eve. So you don't have to have a, a stellar voice. You just have to be able to have a song in your heart. Okay, does that make sense? You know, the nice thing about a large group is as long as four or five people are on key, we'll do fine. <laughs> May the love of God fill you in the name of Jesus Christ through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And all God's kids said, amen. All right.